help us understand sex hormones. Estrogen is going away. The progesterone is going away. The testosterone is going away. Just help us understand the symptoms that come along with those, just because I think that'll help women understand maybe the bigger picture. And I think that's always very useful. Absolutely. It's still, I sound like a broken record, it still depends for a lot yes. of people. Yes. But if I were to make assumptions, the lack of estrogen is primarily probably the the biggest factor in the body's changes postmenopausally. And progesterone has a little bit of effect and testosterone has a little bit of effect, but actually the majority of things are going to come from the low estrogen. So estrogen plays a role from head to toe, which is so crazy that we call them our sex hormones. And, you know, I do too, because they play a role in just like literally basic life functions, hair, skin, nails, eyesight. It's like, come on, really? Um, that can definitely cause the hot flashes. Estrogen actually also controls our, our temperature, our core body temperature. You know, estrogen plays a role in how our AV node connects to our SA node in our heart. So that's one reason the changing or fluctuation of estrogen can cause heart palpitations. Estrogen probably talks to a lot of other hormones. So as estrogen declines, insulin resistance can go up sometimes, and that can cause weight gain, bloating, constipation. You're like, what the heck? Why does estrogen control our gut too? Come on, joint aches and pains. There's estrogen receptors in our joints. And so estrogen really is, the, the, the drop in estrogen is causing the majority of the symptoms. Hey friends, welcome to The Good Life with Michelle Lamoureux, a show for women in midlife who want to live happier, healthier, and more meaningful lives. I'm your host, Michelle Lamoureux, a self-love coach and the author of Design a Life You Love. And together we're going to be doing just that. Each week, I bring on world-class experts, best-selling authors, leading entrepreneurs, and also do solo casts with the intention of inviting you to get connected to what you really desire from your life. This show is produced with love every week. There's inspiration and actionable tips in every episode because I want to see women playing a starring role in their lives instead of living on the sidelines. Be sure to join the Good Life Community newsletter over at thegoodlifecoach.com for more inspiration and tips to live your best midlife. And make sure you're following the show on your favorite podcast player. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome, Dr. Hirsch. I'm so excited that you're on today. I actually learned of your work from Dr. Valerie Cacho, the sleep expert. And um, she came on and I had been mentioning how my show is for women in midlife and how I had covered menopause a couple of times. She goes, oh, no, no. You need to talk to Dr. Heather Hirsch. Hirsch. She's a rock star. She's so amazing. And I go to find you and Oprah had found you. (laughs) So I was like, oh, well. Let's see if I can get her books. I'm really excited that you're here today. Well, thank you so much for having me. You know, it's wonderful that social media has allowed so many of us to interact and to meet each other. And that's how Dr. Concho and I met. And of course, we have so many similar medical topics, sleep, midlife, menopause. Um, And what a joy that it's really come full circle. Yeah. And how was that being on Oprah? Was that like out of the blue or like what happened? So uh, it was sort of out of the blue in February. So the winter of 2023, I really got a call uh, that one of the producers uh, from Oprah Daily uh, was trying to get a hold of me via my writer for my book, Unlock Your Menopause Types, my writer, Stacey Colino. And so really, I remember this night because my husband was teaching a late night class. He teaches at the nursing school and I had all my little kids running around. And within the span of about two to three hours, that late evening in this cold wintry night, I really found out that they were interested in having me on this Live Your Best Life series with Oprah and Drew Barrymore and Maria Shriver. And it was just a whirlwind of excitement and, and just an incredible blessing, uh, an incredible opportunity, not just for me, but for, you know, the millions of women who have, uh, seen it or at least heard of it. And it was just a moment of my life. I will never forget. 
Yeah, no, it's incredible. And and I was happy for you, but also, like you said, I'm happy for all the women who got exposed to it because your book, Unlock Your Menopause Type, is phenomenal. Like, it's so good and it's so interesting the way you've broken it down. We're going to get into it, but it covered everything. And I liked that it was like, okay, if this is your type, consider, you know, here's some breakfast, lunch, and dinner ideas. I love that. And, you know, just understanding how those symptoms, like what particular symptoms might play out and what treatment options might be available because the whole thing is so confusing. I know. It's so confusing, even if you are just trying to get the basic information about menopause. And then not that I meant to confuse it more, but there are some different types of menopause. If you just had cancer treatments, if you're younger, um, you know, if really depression or anxiety is more of your symptom than say the typical hot flashes that we all hear about. Yes. And I, I thank you so much for your kind words because I too really love this book. I find it so inclusive and so freaking cool. Um, that I kind of had this idea, I was flying on a plane when this idea came to me of really breaking it down by type to actually help people even farther than just your basic menopause book. It totally is that because I've read those books, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, and there's, there are a lot of great menopause yes. books. Yes. There really are. And so, you know, that's actually part of you know, behind the scenes of when I wanted to write a book, I really did look at what was already there and really wanted to say, what is it totally different that I have to offer here in this space? And what makes me so unique as a menopause doctor? And when I really sat down and was talking it out with my team, it was really that I very, very much individualized treatment for each and every one of my patients. And even though I couldn't do that in a book, I could at least help to start to explain the process of individualizing it and why, you know, your unique symptoms or your age or your, you know, GYN obstetrical background makes a big difference in how we actually are going to treat you. So this was really my way of putting my unique spin on treating menopause with all the information that's out there. And of course, at the beginning is is a lot of what you'll find in those traditional books of just like the physiology and what's happening. Yeah. And then at the end, like so much more about what this means for you going forward. Um, so I am so proud of this book, really and truly. Yeah, and you should be. And I'm just going to read from um, actually a part of it that so you wrote, um, millions of women have entered menopause each year since the dawn of time. It's so crazy that menopause still feels like uncharted territory for the women who are going through it. I am more than committed to changing that. In my book, Unlocking Your Menopause Type, I am I aim to help you cut through the informational noise and learn how to manage your symptoms effectively by identifying your personal menopause type. And I learned so much and it made me feel like I could be a better advocate for a peer. I mean, I didn't even know about any of the premature menopause type. I didn't know a woman in her 20s or early 30s or whatever could ha- like no awareness. So I think the more we're educated, uh, the better advocates we become for ourselves, but also for other women. And you have a daughter, I have a daughter, mine's a teen, you know, we're going to, it's just hopefully going to be a different situation for them by the time they reach theirs. I, I, I hope so. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and it is so flabbergasting that such an important transition because I actually think, of course, I would think that this is the most important transition in our life. It is just wild that really up until more recently, there has even been dialogue, discussion, celebrities, public figures, uh, clinicians focusing on this transition. But I truly feel that this is the most important because how we treat our bodies through this really sets up how we're going to live the last, our rest of our lives, which is so crucial, you know, yeah. and it's just, you know, on average, if menopause is 51, you know, women between ages 40 and 60 are at the peak of their functionality, both intellectually, you know, um, emotionally, um, maybe we've had children, we know ourselves really well, and to then have this huge, literally hormonal shift that's just been completely erased from medical textbooks 
you know, not at all uh, discussed or really thought of as a big part of our lives. It just blows me away. It, It blows me away. And so as such an advocate for women's health, even when I was going through my training, it wasn't until I did my fellowship training at Cleveland Clinic that I was like, what is menopause? I mean, even me, a self-proclaimed you know, women's health uh, major in college and women's health studies major and you know, always wanted to take care of women. I couldn't believe, I, 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 maybe that's it. Even the fact that even I didn't think about this yeah. until I really saw how women suffered when we are neglected or are not told what happens to our body. I really couldn't turn away ever since then. Absolutely. And the book does help you have those conversations with your doctor and help you get such a good understanding. Cause you know, let's, let's actually dive in. So give us a high level picture of like where we are with the research right now, because I know Mm -hmm. there's not enough done with women from my understanding. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if the pioneers like yourself consult, not just sort of, you know, within the U S but internationally, because I know, for example, in the UK, it seems like they're a bit advanced. Yes. You know, they're doing a lot of social policy change, advocacy change, which is then sort of pushed into insurance coverage for medications and things like that. And so there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of things that we're seeing, for example, in the UK, which is a great place to look, um, that we could really bring and pull here, even though our systems in the US are a little different. Yeah. Um, we could still look to them to sort of see what they are doing. You know, where the research stands is actually quite interesting because truth be told is going to be very hard for a randomized controlled trial of HRT compared to placebo to ever be undertaken again. So we really only have the Women's Health Initiative, which actually a lot of people say was this terrible study, evil study. I sometimes use the word debunked study. It actually wasn't an evil or terrible study. It was a great study. And it's actually where a lot of the safety data of HRT now comes. So what I always say when I'm teaching about the Women's Health Study is Now, 20 years later, with that hindsight, we can actually make a lot of safety statements about HRT from the Women's Health Initiative that originally, when it was published and the results were unadjudicated, all women of all ages were lumped together, it made it seem a lot more unsafe than it does now. But back to what I just said, the uh, what we call the IRBs or the governing body of uh, people at academic institutions in the NIH that make up um, the ethics board of doing studies will say that it is not ethical to randomize women to HRT or to placebo. So we will probably uh, never have another big study like that. And that's still because there are these deep-seated biases that these medications are unsafe. And so, so much of the time on social media, while there isn't a one size fit all, and I talk so much about that in my book, yes. I do spend a fair amount of time breaking down HRT on online on my platforms because that's really where there's so much misinformation. But that still exists. And I am firm in my belief that another randomized placebo controlled trial where you are taking a pill of either HRT or placebo that the participant doesn't know what it is will probably never again be approved. So we have to basically look at prospective studies, Mm. which means that the best we can do is watch women going forward who elect or who choose to take HRT. And we're probably never really going to have studies where they look at one regimen head to head compared to another regimen. And this is things they do all the time with cholesterol medications, with blood pressure medications, but it's going to be deemed unethical to do this when it comes to HRT. And so as crazy as that thinks, and as much research is still going on, I can certainly point to some of the research that people are doing in terms of uh, brain health uh, and, and cardiovascular health and others. But women in midlife thinking about HRT and doctors, clinicians, healthcare providers, pharmacists, we're never going to have those big randomized control trials probably ever again because of those essentially deep seated biases that HRT is still bad for you. Right. And so just to clarify too, because I think what I understand for that study is that women walked away or this 
we were, it was concluded that it was there was a link to breast cancer. Is that correct? So it made women afraid. So even though it was being prescribed back then, it stopped. Is that right? Just to, just to clarify. Exactly. And the the quick way of saying this with the TLDR, if you will, <laughs> is that um, when the study ended abruptly, only in the estrogen plus progesterone arm, estrogen conjugated equine estrogen and medroxyprogesterone acetate or PremPro, the media reported a 26% increased risk of breast cancer. And okay. that sounds wild. Yes. But absolute risk needs to be translated to relative risk. The actual numbers, which was four women out of a thousand women oh. over five years who took oral PremPro four women out of a thousand over five years. And <clears throat> once that was sort of digestible, though the media loved saying 26%, you start to, my patients, every time I say that, they're like, oh, okay, that that doesn't sound so scary. Really that, that sounds kind of like, you know, baseline risk. Yes. Um, and since that time, we've found that different formulations of uh, hormone therapy, so particularly maybe prometrium or estradiol, which was not used in the WHI, is even safer. So imagine mm -hmm. if the risk, therefore, is the same risk as being overweight or having diabetes or smoking or drinking a glass of wine a day. You know, these are the truths about the links to cancers. And these links have always been associations. They've really actually never been proven cause and effect to this day. Oh, wow. Okay. And this is why it's so confusing. I mean, and if the doctors don't, you know, or have bias because of that study too, and the rest of us don't even know about that study or we've heard it, right? right. Or like you say, right. there's a lot of these gurus online that are just spreading a lot of misinformation, which I know is frustrating to you, which is probably another reason you wrote this book. It really is. There is. It is like the wild, wild west of information out there. Because then you have people saying, well, pellets are safer, or this compounding cream is safer. And, you know, people, women are, it's not their fault. It's not their fault that they are trying to get help. And those are the resources available to them. Yeah. Really, truly, it's on the medical community. I, and that's why I really put myself out there a lot. And, and I have a class, I teach clinicians. But Exactly. And, and, or there's people again, still, still continuing to say that you can't take HRT because your mom had breast cancer, silly things like this. Um, and so I really want women to, to at least be armed with a complete set of facts and make their own darn conclusion other than their doctor just simply saying no, or their doctor saying, let me inject you with this, you know, and, and not feeling like they have ownership of their, their body. Oh my gosh. And that's so, I love that you said that because this is what it comes down to. We should feel that we do have that ownership. Okay. Well, help us understand. Um, let's talk about the types. Cause when we went through, when I went through the book, I was like, okay, I, I think I'm, I'm still in perimenopause and, mm -hmm. and, and maybe you can also explain. So the duration, cause it seems like it lasts a long time. Yeah. Um, right. Or yeah. can last a long time. It depends. Each, each woman's having her own experience is another takeaway, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, a 75% of women have symptoms that last on average five to seven years. And since you are in perimenopause, me too, we know that symptoms can last many years and that they really start before our periods even stop. Right. And so you add this on to the fact that clinicians know very little about menopause or HRT, and then you have its cousin perimenopause. And women are always wondering why they're feeling hot or they're feeling anxious or they're tossing and turning at night because they're still getting their periods. Or like me, you might have no periods because you have either an ablation, a hysterectomy or a marina. And so you kind of lose track of time because we're so busy as women. Um, but symptoms can start in perimenopause. Um, and uh, nod to, I may be working on something in that realm for perimenopause specifically. But jumping to now the different types, we have premature menopause, which is a clinical diagnosis, at, or sorry, this is a, a real diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis, but it is an actual 
diagnosis code. Yeah. And the definition is uh, menopause before age 40. Okay. Uh, as premature menopause, my youngest patient ever was 17. I have plenty of patients in their 20s and 30s, oh, whether wow. it's autoimmune or surgery or uh, some other reason. There is a couple of reasons you could have premature and then early menopause is before age 45. Oh, wow. Uh, and for these women, HRT is the gold standard of care. This is very much like you have hypothyroidism, we give you thyroid. You have premature menopause, we give you estrogen yes. and then progesterone if you have your uterus still in. Sudden menopause type really is kind of typifi typified by the woman who goes right into menopause, whether it's chemotherapy, you know, or surgery for cancer or precancerous diagnosis or concern for cancer, um, harsh medications like Lupron for endometriosis. Uh, Lupron can be used to, um, uh, even for like fertility treatments, if you're doing egg retrievals, all sorts of things that can put you into sudden menopause. Mm -hmm. Um, Full throttle menopause is exactly what it sounds like, like symptoms from north to south, you know, hair loss and brain fog and irritability and trouble sleeping and dry skin and dry vagina and dry eyes, just all the things. Mind altering menopause type is one that's also quite important to me because I do believe that many women are misdiagnosed. Uh, as either having uh, depression, anxiety, bipolar, uh, when really actually their hormones are causing a significant part of their mood symptoms. Now, I never want to say that that means there could be two things going on at the same time, yeah. but we see that the loss of hormones for many women significantly impacts their mood and they may not even be the one with the hot flashes or the vaginal dryness, like the textbook menopause. So they may be wondering around what's wrong with them, put on antidepressants, et cetera, when actually it may be HRT that's more helpful. Wow. Yeah. The uh, seemingly never ending is exactly what it sounds like. And actually, if there's one type that we could probably put an end to, it's the seemingly never ending. And, you know, this is because, again, there are still women who are in their late 50s and their 60s and their 70s you know, who never feel like they got the right treatment, never got around to it, always thought it was going to go away. Um, and, and there's a lot of, uh, caregiver strain, guilt, um, uh, you know, uh, lots of things involved in that seemingly never ending. Yes. And then silent also exactly what it sounds like. This is the friend who never had a hot flesh in her life, but we talked a lot about this on Oprah's live the life you want series. When Maria Shriver really jumped in, we talked about how your bones still change, your brain still changes. So your body still changes. Mm -hmm. Even if you never have that outward symptom of, say, a hot flash, your body still significantly changes. And the hot flash may even remind you that it's menopause, right, in some ways. So my patients with sudden or silent, rather silent menopause type may actually kind of forget uh routine screenings or just checking in with their doctors because like on the outside they're they feel they great, feel great. But their body's yeah. still changing inside wow okay yeah i think i have a combination based on what i read i think a little bit of the silent a little bit of the mind altering but then a few of the other things <laughs> that come with full throttle so i don't know maybe um but it's not it's not bad and so like i know i love my GYN. She's fantastic and very easy to talk to and very willing to accommodate. So I feel very blessed because I know that's not always the situation, but she's like, you know, you, you're still getting a period. So you're still producing estrogen. Let's wait. Like she was like, let's wait, you know, in terms, but now that I read your book too, I'm realizing, well, if it's more of the mind stuff, then maybe it wouldn't be HRT for me anyway, which mm -hmm. I, right. Is that true? Is that, am I understanding that or yeah, you know, well, it's again, I'm going to go back to my it's, visual, yeah. like, yeah, it's really yeah. individualized. Um, this is sort of a hot button topic right now is the use of postmenopausal HRT in perimenopause, which yes. is kind of like what you might, you know, where you might, you know, sort of say, hmm, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a hot button issue because it's a fun topic. It's kind of new. I learned how to do this when I was in fellowship training by my mentor, Dr. Thacker. So not that I, you know, uh, didn't know this without my amazing teachers and mentors and clinicians. 
But in my practice, I routinely will do um, menopo- postmenopausal estrogen and progesterone in perimenopause as my patients need it or want to trial it. Yes. Um, it could, of course, in my book, I talk a lot about other things for the mind altering menopause type. Um, so sometimes there's great non hormonal options. And then, of course, just because I, I, you're giving me the space to be obsessed with my book. Um, you know, in the back of the book, gosh, we spend a whole chapter on, um, over the counter, things you can do at home to relieve your symptoms. So, you know, not that it's solely relying certainly on prescriptions. I think that, of course, there really is a place. And when you're thinking about treatment, you know, I wanted this book to help my patients to guide them, have discussions with their doctors, but also there is also so much you could do for heart palpitations, for pain with intercourse, you know, right off the bat. Right. Totally. And I guess what I'm wondering too is some, everyone has their own, but like my mom, for example, she had, she was probably one of your nose symptoms. Like she said, it was nothing for her. So far, (laughs) mine's been pretty, like, it's very much on the mild side. So if there are a little bit of the other things, it sort of comes and goes, it's nothing chronic. Can that change though? That can, like, as you're losing the estrogen and the progesterone and the testosterone, all the sex hormones are diminishing as your periods are like fading away. Um, that's when maybe all of a sudden you can end up with the hot flashes. Like I've never had that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm just curious, like, so it can just keep changing as you get closer to, to the other side. Isn't that so fun? Oh yes. no, that is what it is. Right. Okay. It can, although that doesn't mean it will. Okay. So, um, we have a tendency to follow our mother's patterns, but not always. So, yeah. you know, you may have it more milder symptoms, Um, But now you're really armed with a lot of facts that potentially uh, for someone, I'm going to make up some scenarios that ringing in your ear, that vertigo that you have may be from the hormones changing versus, you know, some viral illness, especially if it's persistent or it's cyclic. Um, You may sail right through it because your perimenopause overall is quite well, um, you know, you're tolerating not a lot of symptoms or you're absolutely right. It could switch on a dime where, you know, 18 months down the road, your periods have stopped for, you know, several months and all of a sudden you're waking up hot and sweaty. But, you know, this is so interesting because without a crystal ball, we have no good way of knowing Although your perimenopause is a little window into menopause, postpartum is a little window into menopause. If there was like postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, postpartum blues, that could be maybe why now you think some sort of mood changes as well. So, you know, I will, this women's health, women's hormonal physiology will literally never cease to amaze me. It's so fascinating. I think it's just so interesting. Yeah. Um, I wish we had essentially like precision medicine where I could say, well, Michelle, you know, and your periods are going to end in 2026 in <laughs> June. And, um, you know, leading up to that, you're going to be okay. You're going to only have one year of hot flashes. You're going to be fine. You can take HRT for that one year and then be done. And then, you know, but we don't have that yet. And that yeah. would be so cool if we did. Yeah. And the so, best we kind of have is these little clues. Yes. And one of the things you write about in the book that I appreciated, you're like, don't have this conversation at your well visit. Oh my gosh. I said, I know, <laughs> you know, it's so that's, funny. You know, that's I always really get, important because it's really important. I always get so much backlash when I say that. No, because, it's made so much sense. I'm like, oh my gosh. Cause you're trying to like, and you only get your whatever, 15 minutes. 15 so, minutes. Not so should you be like, this should be an ongoing, like, that's what it feels like with me and my GYN now. She's like, let's see, but if anything changes, come back. Yeah. Like, you want to, you know, you know, the reason I get so much backlash and I, I understand this from both sides. Cause okay. of, of course I'm a clinician, but you know, whenever I do this on say social media or TikTok, everyone's like, well, I don't have the money to go to the doctors twice. Uh, and I don't have the time to go to the doctors twice. And I, I know, I know it sucks, but the truth, truth being told, you know, at your annual visit, your doctor has this really long agenda that they've got to get through. And that leaves two minutes. I mean, I, for my new patients now, I'm, I mean, I, I left academic medicine in 2022. I now have a private telemedicine practice. So I'm kind of lucky. I get an hour to talk to my patients about menopause wow. and perimenopause. 
and half an hour when they come back. But you know, that is is certainly I'm I'm aware that that is a a resource that is you know um, that there is a privilege to have. Mm. But again, just my pro tip is if you can, even if you can do telemedicine, because you don't need an exam to talk about your symptoms. Really, truly, you don't. Um, you you really should want make a separate problem focused visit with your internist or your gynecologist because they're going to have that whole time. Be it fifteen golden minutes, thirty you know silver minutes, whatever it is, just to think about that versus your Pap smear and getting their gloves out and asking how you're doing and making sure your vaccines are up to date and doing your breast exam and doing your mammogram and you know checking your bones and refilling any medications. It, they have so much to do that it's it's just not going to make the priority list here, and you've got to give it its own time and space if 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 possible. Yeah, I I I think that made so much sense to me. I was thinking also it would be an interesting study. How many marriages dissolve when this happens? Because you mm-hmm. talk about sit down with your family and explain. Because if women's unfamiliar with all these changes and isn't even associating dry eyes, for example, like things you wouldn't right. or like burning mouth, who knew, right? Or itchy skin, yeah, like, right? You're not associating these as actual things that are happening, but the irritability and all those things that could be happening. So yeah. I just think it's interesting because having that conversa- conversation, once you get educated, does seem really important so that if you fly yes. off the handle and you're like, I don't feel myself, you truly yes. don't feel yourself, right? Yes. Yes. I, I actually ha- just had an incredible interview yesterday. Um, uh, with a host who was, you know, male partner to a female. And I said, it's so exciting when, um, you know, it's heteronormative, but, you know, men and women are together, um, which isn't always the case, but specific, or if you're, you're, if a female partner hasn't gone through menopause, but, uh, for men, that sort of just inherent fluctuation of hormones every single day is, you know, not something they really have to experience. And being able to talk to our families, being able to have men sort of actually learn about this so that they don't feel like this is a personal attack or this is anything to do with them and they could maybe help you through it. Yeah. You know, there are sexual health changes. People start sleeping in separate beds. You don't want to be touched anymore. You know, you're so irritable. You're snapping. There's so many things yeah. that can absolutely distance partners from each other during mm-hmm. this time. But if you are having these conversations, especially if men are paying attention, you know, because men are problem solvers, they love solving problems so that if they can solve a problem, they they kind of feel better, right, men? Yeah. So by they bond by solving problems, women, we bond by communicating. And so, you know, every time I I get to have interviews with men, they're so interesting because there's like, well, Dr. Hirsch, there's treatment. This is so exciting. How long has this been around? And I'm like, I don't know, 1960? (laughs) Um, you're like, there's vaginal just, estrogen cream. If there's vaginal dryness yeah, and painful intercourse, there's, there's right? So yeah. many options here. Yeah. And so getting our male partners, if we have one interested and involved and sort of in this and explaining these things, yes. it's so helpful. Okay. I do just, can you just help us understand sex hormones? Estrogen is going away. The progesterone is going away. The testosterone is going away. Just help us understand the symptoms that come along with those, just because I think that'll help women understand maybe the bigger picture. And I think that's always very useful. So absolutely. It's still, I sound like a broken record, it still depends for a lot of people. But if I were to make assumptions, the lack of estrogen is primarily probably the the biggest factor in the body's changes postmenopausally. And progesterone has a little bit of effect and testosterone has a little bit of effect, but actually the majority of things are going to come from the low estrogen. So estrogen plays a role from head to toe, which is so crazy that we call them our sex hormones. And you know, I do too, because they play a role in just like literally basic life functions, hair, skin, nails, eyesight. It's like, come on, really? Um, that can definitely cause the hot flashes. Um, estrogen actually also controls our, our temperature, our core body temperature. Ah. You know, estrogen plays a role in how our AV node connects to our SA node in our heart. So that's one reason the changing or fluctuation of estrogen can cause heart palpitations. 
Estrogen probably talks to a lot of other hormones. So as estrogen declines, insulin resistance can go up sometimes, and that can cause weight gain, bloating, constipation. They're like, what the heck? Why does estrogen control our gut to? Come on, joint aches and pains. There's estrogen receptors in our joints. And so estrogen really is... uh, the, the, the drop in estrogen is causing the majority of the symptoms. Now, progesterone okay. loss can cause uh, trouble falling asleep, trouble with relaxation, sometimes that new onset anxiety that you feel even before menopause and perimenopause. And so progesterone's main role in hormone therapy and the main reason we give it is actually because if you still have your uterus, I could increase your risk for uterine cancer if I don't give you the right progesterone. But in some women, it has some benefits of sleep and calming your mood a little bit. So that's kind of what progesterone does. And testosterone is interesting because there's a lot we don't know. It's definitely involved in libido. Duh, that would make sense. There has to be some kind of hormone that's encouraging us, rewarding us for sex because that's how we can propagate the species. And so testosterone is mainly involved in libido, but could it be involved in mental clarity and muscle mass and, you know, other things? Yeah, yeah, maybe we still don't totally know. The NIH isn't always doling out money for studying testosterone in postmenopausal women, you see. Yeah. So it's hard to really kind of say. But hopefully that at least gives you a, a little bit of a breakdown. Yeah. So is there any downside to trying HRT if you're perimenopausal having an array of symptoms? Like I know it's individual, so I'm obviously, and we'll just say quickly, this is Dr. Hirsch is not your doctor. This is not intended to be medical <laughs> this is advice. Not direct medical um, advice. Yeah, consult yeah. with your trusted healthcare provider. But that being yes. said, um, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, so I have to say that um, you know, what I do, I'll tell you what I do with my patients. Yeah. Um, you know, I always tell my patients, most of them are the majority of them are coming to me with some symptoms. Um, and you know, I always say <clears throat> when we're thinking about HRT, I always say, you know what, let's not call this, we're going on HRT. Let's call this a trial period hmm. of HRT. And we usually do a six to eight week, two month trial period of HRT. And so your question is, is there any downside? You know, if you think about it, like, okay, I'm just going to do a trial. And I always tell my patients, let's see, do your symptoms get better? Do you have, you know, side effects that are bothersome? Do do you, you know, you'll get this complete by bio or body feedback essentially, right? Yes. Of, oh my goodness, my patients say, wow, I feel night and day. Okay, they probably want to stay on it, right? Yes. Some of my patients say, that's probably the majority. Some of my patients I'll say, okay, I feel like a little bit better. And so I say, okay, do you want to tweak it a little bit and stay on this trial? And they're like, yeah, okay. And sometimes <laughs> my patients have some side effects. And so we have to tweak that still, or, you know, they'll find that for whatever reason, it didn't work for them. This is less likely, but a patient of mine, a patient comes to mind every time we tried estrogen, she just always got nauseous. And she finally decided, oh, I think I just want to call it call it a day for now, Heather. And I said, that's great. You know what? Let's do some, uh, what are the other symptoms that are bothering you? Let's see what else we can control them. And you just turn that medicine right off. And so I think, you know, for the majority of women who have symptoms, you know, the majority of women are are good candidates for um, hormone replacement therapy. And if you think about this more as like, Let's do this trial period before I ultimately decide. You know, it's kind of a little bit of a psychological game, I guess, but it it makes you feel really relieved. Like, oh, you know, you still get to sort of try it on before you decide if you really want to take it for for longer. And then, you know, I think your next question might be, what would that look like? And I always tell my patients, there's no time limit to the use of HRT, but there's no pressure either. So if you want to take it for one, two, three years, if you want to take it for one, two, three decades, as long as you're still a good candidate, I don't pressure you to stay on. I don't pressure you to come off yes. again, of course, if you're medically cleared. So, you know, it's such a fun, you can see how I have such fun doing my job because it's, it's really like, um, putting the individual pieces together for my patients and everyone is just on a completely different regimen and it totally suits exactly what they need. And, and it's just such a joy to do. So what's confusing to me is I had a doctor once a couple of years ago say something like, well, once you have symptoms, we can look at birth control. Does that make sense? 
Oh, oh yes. This is another hot button topic. In fact, I'm going to do a YouTube video on this later today. I just was very confused. And can I just tell you, this is how ignorant I was because birth control was something I thought it was like in my 20s, you know what I mean? Before I got married. And I didn't even think about the fact that it's hormones. Like I never thought about that. It's HR, it's hormone therapy. It's the exact same thing. It it really is hormone therapy in, in many, many, many ways. Yeah. So, um, I actually am I actually really truly this is a question I get all the time now. And so I'm going to do a, a whole video on this. But you know, it's funny. I think um the use of postmenopausal HRT while a woman is still menstruating seems to give OBGYNs the heebie jeebies. I don't know why. They're just worried you're gonna get pregnant or they're not gonna know if the bleeding's abnormal and they just like cannot, it just makes them verklempt to think about. And so <laughs> The difference between birth control pills is they are, they're both estrogen and progesterone. Birth control pills are much stronger. They're like 10 times stronger. They can work really well, but there's a couple downsides to this. One, it's an oral combination of ethanol, estradiol, and norethindrone versus postmenopausal HRT, which often we could do bioidentical. That's a slang term, but FDA approved estradiol and prometrium. So Actually, postmenopausal dosing is actually so much safer, so much more easy to change the doses. Whereas when we give you birth control, we're just splatting you with a daily pill of ethanol, estradiol, and norethindrone. And that birth control also is going to just completely eat up any free testosterone that you have left. So it can lead to a lot of dryness, worsening libido for women in the, in perimenopause. So I actually, actually truly I have some patients who are actually back on birth control and it's working great for them. Um, but the majority of my patients, I usually use postmenopausal HRT for. And again, this is really individualized. I have a patient, nice. I'll tell you two different stories. She was on like a birth control called Janelle in her 20s and 30s. She came off, had her kids. And then five years later now, she's in her mid 40s and she's seeing me. And I said, you know, she said, well, I always ask my patients, what do you think? Um, Because I like to give them room. And so she said, you know, I think I'd be fine trying the Junelle again. I said, great. How did you do on it in her 20s and 30s? She's like, I freaking rocked it on the Junelle. We started it. She's she's doing great. I did give her a little bit of vaginal estrogen because she was having some dryness. But for the majority of my patients, they don't want to go back on birth control. Either they didn't like it. They totally they, and, and I, you know, I'll say, why don't we try a little bit of progesterone at nighttime? And then they feel great. And then when their hot flashes get better, maybe we add a little bit of an estrogen gel, you know, it's not birth control, but they know that. And for the majority of my patients, that's usually what I do. So I will make a longer video on this, but that's the long and the short of it. Okay. I appreciate it. Cause I was just a little surprised. She said that, cause I did think the gold standard was the HRT or Anyway, so it was just a little confusing. And then, like I said, I was like, oh, right. Birth control regulates. Her. Like, I didn't think about that at the time. You're not even I didn't you're even not have the thinking about it that I have now, I guess. I don't I don't know. Yeah, yeah. you're not thinking about it, but you're absolutely right. It is. It's a little bit of like a mind twister when you were like, huh, I actually is. Isn't that isn't that hormone therapy? Right, that's hormone. It, it basically is. Um, just higher I, just, doses. I have to ask equine horse urine and the estrogen like what's the is that the standard like what is that about I'm just was a little surprised when I read that I was like wait a second what is estrogen yeah yeah where are we getting it yeah yeah there's two big forms of estrogen and I'm glad you actually asked this because as we're kind of wrapping it wrapping it up you know we've talked a little bit about postmenopausal HRT I talked about the WHI so there's really two 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 main of formulations of estrogen, conjugated equine estrogens. That's what, what they use in the WHI. And absolutely, if it's conjugated equine estrogen, that actually does come from horse's urine. Yes. It's still in the market, still available. Most of my patients prefer estradiol. So estradiol does not mean that it's compounded. It can, it absolutely can and should be FDA approved. So there's oral estradiol patch, gels, sprays, and this is a plant-based estrogen. Although you can't probably, you you can't probably, I shouldn't have said the word probably, you can't eat enough yams or like go get some grass outside and rub it under your skin. But the formulation is plant-based and it's still, you know, made in a lab and, and, and packaged and, you know, then given to you at a commercial pharmacy. But the majority of my patients do prefer uh, to use um, estradiol. Now I'll just top this off. I know I'm probably going to get a lot of comments for this, but I always say, look, if I was stranded on a deserted island 
and I was never to come back and all that was there was Prem Pro, I too would probably take it because, you know, certainly I understand that many people have ethical concerns. Got you. I hear you too. And many people would rather prefer estradiol. But for those few patients who are still on conjugated equine estrogens, I also want you to know that really, truly, these are still FDA approved. They are regulated and they do serve a good purpose. Okay. I just, I was like, what? Like, I just, I I had to read that twice. I just, I was like, okay. Um, Anything I didn't ask you today that you want to leave the women listening with? Anything that you... Oh, thank you so much. Really, just truly, I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate... Um, that you got a chance to read the book and you really enjoyed it because it was such a labor of love. Oh my gosh, you know. Um, and it's so much easier to just, you know, j- jump into a video and put that on social media than write a book. <laughs> you know, it's just a long, long process. But I, I really just, you know, have had just such a wonderful career and so lucky to have all this knowledge. I want to share as much as it is I can with women, whether it's through my free stuff, my book, seeing me as your doctor, you know, I really want patients to feel so much autonomy and, and really just to thank you for taking the time to talk about midlife and menopause, because it's so important that, that we have space for this. Absolutely. Well, just a fun question then. How do you define living a good life? What does it mean to you, Heather? Dr. Heather, I'll say. <laughs> so, for me, I have found actually, I, I could talk about this for a, a while, but for me actually now where I am currently living a good life to me it means that I have the time and the freedom to uh, practice how I want and uh and to be the kind of clinician that I want and 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 that's kind of a little personal story. I told you a little bit how I came from academic medicine and struggling to see all my patients in 15 minutes and and it was so difficult and I actually did a lot of therapy to kind of step away from the hospital and leave my amazing job at Harvard but the good life for me is like I can drop my kids off at 9:30 at daycare, do this podcast with you go make some content, see my patients tomorrow via telemedicine, have an hour with them. That to me is the good life. Uh, but it, but you know, it always changes. The good life should always change because we're all, we're never going to be the same people we were. Um, but having freedom, having autonomy of your time, ah, that is a good life to me. Well, good for you. And that's what I was blown away with when I read the book and how comprehensive this is unlock your menopause type, which I'll have the in the show notes. And I'm going to direct you now to Dr. Hirsch's website. I was like, how, how is she doing the practice <laughs> and the book and the podcast and all the social media? Like I was just a little, like, just tell us quickly a little bit about like, what are your like success habits? I'm just I, personally I about intrigued. Died. So, so my young, my, my youngest baby was born prematurely at 30 weeks While he was like two weeks old in the NICU, I was doing publishing meetings, selling this proposal. So it was just wild. Um, Truly, I think that um, I am honestly incredibly blessed to have an incredible partner. And my partner helps me so much. My husband helps me so much. He is an incredible person, my biggest cheerleader. So, you know, when I had a deadline, he was like, you know, go to your office. I'm taking the kids to the park. I'll be back in like three hours. And I was like, but you're going to be so mad when you come back. <laughs> Never. You know, he really just <laughs> helps so much. Um, you know, I, I couldn't do that forever. I was just so burnt out. And so I really had to get really laser focused on what really made me happy. And, and, you know, so I like to, um, uh, batch things sometimes. So, you know, later today, I'll probably go film two or three YouTube videos. And that way I've kind of got them. I finally got some help. So someone to help me, uh, you know, put edit things and do that. That took me a really long time. I was doing everything myself. Um, but my success story, I don't know, you know, I just, I just, um, I just, I get up every day thinking like life is so beautiful. We're so lucky to be on this planet. And, you know, how can I make each day fun and exciting and meet new people and challenge myself? And so 
I, I think I just love to be busy. And you know what? Don't leave thinking that there isn't a drop of like workaholic in me. Okay. There's a little bit of that. So don't <laughs> think this is normal. I think I thrive off of, off of those things. And I, you know, I will always strive to, to work on making sure I'm maintaining that one. So I'm not a perfect human. Ever. Yeah. Well, we're grateful for the work that you're doing in the world. Where do I direct people? Like where should people find you, the book, oh, the podcast, oh my gosh. Your, really? your, your practice, your private practice. Yes. You what can state? find everything. Yeah. Uh, what states? Yep. Um, so you can find everything on my website, heatherhirschmd.com. Yeah. And yeah. I'm at Heather Hirsch MD across all social media platforms. I see patients currently in eight states, California, New York, uh, Massachusetts, Florida, Ohio, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Alaska. Uh, And I'm working on getting more all the time. And I've got a ton of resources on my website. I've got some courses. I've got my book. I do have a course for healthcare providers um, on how to do HRT. Um, And we talk all about this and MHT or menopausal hormone therapy for perimenopause. And so I've got so much stuff there. My little website is my little storefront. So come visit it, please. I love it. And I'll have all of the show notes over at thegoodlifecoach.com with all the links we just talked about and access to Dr. Hirsch's amazing book, which I highly recommend you pick a copy up for yourself and share this interview with a friend, all your friends, because we need to get educated and support one another and be able to have these conversations without it feeling like some weird taboo topic, because it's all, we're all having our own experience with it. And um, I think the more we can make it just like okay to talk about the the more help we're going to be able to get right yeah exactly thank you thank you so much for having me thank you so much it's been my pleasure thank you thanks so much for tuning in today i hope you gained some new information or inspiration for your life that is that the essence of this show is to really wake up to what's possible for you to reclaim your beautiful voice and to really learn to love and prioritize yourself so if you gained any value from any of the conversations you've tuned into make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player you can do that right now on your phone And please do consider leaving a rating and review if you have yet to do so on Apple Podcasts. It's actually how more women can find the show. And I really want to grow a community of women who are loving themselves and living full on. So thank you as always for tuning in. And I look forward to reconnecting with you next Wednesday. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.